As of the 23rd of October 2023, I'm stationed way out in the northeast Siberian tundra. We've got these little caravan type things to live in for a couple weeks that we're staying. Why am I out here? Work. There's no other reason to be out this far, not for any man. Thus it came as a shock finding a dead body all the way out in the literal middle of nowhere. Hundreds of miles from civilization. I see no feasible explanation as to how this man got out here. I'm part of a team assigned to a geological survey. Simply put, I'm here to analyze soil. Yeah, it's exhilarating. Anyway, that's beside the point. I'm not here to detail my scintillating career. I found the body on the second day on a slope out westwards. The cold had set him into a statue inevitably but it looked like he had died crawling on all fours. Something seemed off about the way that he was posed, which I quickly realized was due to him resting on two legs and one arm. The corpse still had all its limbs, it's just that the left arm was pulled up into the chest and the hand attached was clasped tightly around a book, a journal to be exact. Naturally, I read a fair few pages before having the idea to write this. Writing's not something that I frequent, and it doesn't come easy to me, so you'll forgive me if my tone leans towards being clinical. I'm a dirt analyst, give me a break. Anyway, I thought the journal might shed some light on how this guy wound up all the way out here in this barren place. That said, its contents are strange to say the least, and I'm not closer to an answer as I was when I first discovered the body. I don't know what to make of the journal's contents, but I'm hoping this is just a sick joke, or some monumental misunderstanding. The way that it's written seems literary in nature, although as I found out later on there may be a good reason for that. I'm going to transcribe the first few pages below. I'll start with the only page with a bookmark. That is, if you could call an old shred of fabric a bookmark. Anyway, here it is. Do you think we're dead? I gave Eleanor a perplexed look. I can see your breath and we're talking right now, so... No, no, she muttered, shivering in the keening wind. Not here, no sense in asking that here. I mean out there. I stared out past the dark sea, reaching to the horizon and likely further still than I could ever conceive of. They say that hell is hot. As I said on the ramshackle heights that we fight every day to maintain, the cold clawing at my skin, I truly wish it was. My mother used to say, as long as you tried. Those five words hammered strength into my psyche that once gave meaning in battling hardships and misery. Now, well that's a dangerous epithet. You're free to try if so inclined. Just know that none of us will even try to save you when your belly is sliced open and your guts slurped by the creatures that dog this place. We've had our fill of brazen souls out here. They serve to be torn apart in our place. I suppose that it's something to be grateful for. The braver you are, the quicker that you'll learn. Bravery is as insubstantial as death in this place. I should backtrack. I'm an extremophile, always have been. After the first time that adrenaline rush flooded my veins, I was hooked. Water sports, base jumping, spelunking, anything you can name, it's likely under my belt. The one activity that I found myself coming back to was mountaineering. Ever since my dad took me up at Mount Snowden, there's been an inscrutable urge to summit something higher, something steeper and harsher. This leads me to my most recent trip, summiting Monte Rosa's tallest peak, the Dufer Spitz. My climbing partner and good friend Rob climbed it in 2018. He shared plans of a second summit so I took him up on the offer. I say climbing partner, but with my skill level, I really mean guide. Rob's expertise blows mine out of the water. Nothing much of interest happened on the drive, long boring and standard overall. When we arrived, the parking lot serving as our starting point was empty and quiet, dead still. 
There was an air of unease lingering around us. Around me, at least. If Rob felt it, he didn't show it. But it was there, and I should have taken it as a warning. That's retrospection for you. Looking up at Monterosa made everything seem so insignificant. Its monster of a rock face stood mighty and gazed out across the landscape. Ants beholden to a molehill in its dominance. God help any who climb it. Instead, we planned around the Marinelli Colour, a steep and snow-laden gully. We triple-checked our mandatory gear, ice picks, crampons, ropes, etc., all present. Clear and cold mornings were forecast for the ensuing week. Perfect climbing conditions. Rob's meticulous planning was impressive, to say the least. I would be lying if I said I wasn't a little envious. The mountain hut alone was a four-hour climb, though the terrain was forgiving. Hard-packed snow crackled below my crampons. A reassuring sound. Inside was cozy. The walls were insulated well and the wood stove was stocked with more than enough firewood. Yet even as the fire roared, a chill crawled on my back. Just like the parking lot, we were alone and a nagging intuition in the back of my mind said that it may not be coincidental. I'm sure you're ready for tomorrow, mate, Rob said, glancing over at me from the counter. Uh, why, I mean, yeah, yep, I'm in good hands coming with you. Look, once we're up into the Kalur, we aren't turning back, so there's no shame in having second thoughts. No, oh, no, it's not that, it's, I mean, yeah, I could come back another time. But who knows how long that I would have to wait. Life's hectic, you know. Might be years past till I can try again. Just making sure, nerves are a dangerous beast up there. As long as you listen to me, you'll be fine, but remember, don't panic. If you're feeling anxious, remind yourself that getting upset won't help your situation. Heat from the waning coals coddled my body. Only embers that flickered by the time that I began to nod off into a deep and dreamless sleep. We set off at 8am after having oatmeal and berries. The first few hours ended up being a tough yomp along the snowfield skirting around towards the Kalur. Azura sky gazed down through wispy high cirrus. We were about a mile from the gully when light snowfall started up. It wasn't hugely surprising being in a mountain and all, but the sky remained clear. If anything, it had grown clearer over the past hour, and still the snow fell regardless. It was such a bizarre sight that I worried I might be getting altitude sickness. As icy pinpricks pelted my skin, the reality of the situation dawned on me. Visibility was dropping by the minute and within ten, I could scarcely see Rob twenty feet ahead and then he was gone. I don't mean his silhouette bled away into the whiteout. I mean even his footprints were entirely covered over. I called out to him in a panic, cupping my hands together in a futile attempt to pierce the howling gale. Hoping to catch sight of Rob, I plodded forward another hundred or so yards. Nothing. My next actions I still ruminate over today, forcing me to curse my own cowardice. Even if I was the one who had disappeared, I didn't know that at the time. Without Rob to guide me, I thought that I was surely going to die. And so I turned back. Following the compass, I made a steady descent, hoping to get back to the hut faster than we had come up. The fresh dusting of snow made frantic steps a danger and I slipped several times. After an hour, my view was unchanged, pure whiteness. In my retreat, I had somehow failed to notice a crucial detail. I wasn't going downhill. It seemed like I was in a flat snowfield, but when I turned to full 360 to get my bearings, I found that I was actually facing a gentle incline. A fresh wave of terror crashed down in my mind. I glanced down at the compass and to my horror, saw its needle replaced by a listless spinning blur. I tried my best. Mom would have been proud. But the cold wore me down, the snow merciless as it pelted me. My footsteps grew closer and closer together until there were no footsteps at all. I crouched on one knee, 
I wasn't shivering anymore. Well, I did feel pretty warm. Hot, actually. I went to unzip my coat when a stark patch of lime caught my attention. An abandoned tent. Long left to endure the elements. It looked old. My dulling mind it didn't catch the oddity that it wasn't already buried by snow. Our tent was in Rob's pack, and with him out of the picture this was my only chance at survival. There were a few small tears in the canvas, but the tent sufficed in its primary purpose. Still, I had no means of warming myself up. Bundled tight in my sleeping bag, I felt the weight of exhaustion settle, and no sooner did my eyelids droop and my eyes roll back. The fact that I awoke at all filled me with a sense of relief. Brain still groggy, I sat up and observed the tent's interior. It had fared a while in the figurative flashbang of a snowstorm. Something was different. The small tears only looked out onto white, but all was quiet. Never has there been a silent blizzard. Only when a cold shock hit my foot did I notice the mounds of melting slush on the floor directly beneath each rip in the tent. I was snowed in. Adrenaline flooded my veins and sent my thoughts into hyperspeed. How long had I been buried? How much oxygen was left in the tent? How deep was I? Don't panic. Freaking out won't help you. I took a deep, controlled breath and crawled over to the zipper, hesitating before tugging it open in one swift motion. White fluff poured into the tent and, in a transitory state between dread and understanding, I scrabbled backwards in fear of an icy casket. My mind cleared. Logically, if the snow was that powdery, I couldn't be down very deep. But still, the tent sagged, its backbone long since snapped. I dragged myself out and pushed my way through the dampening snow, lugging the pack with all my equipment behind me. With the gap collapsing in on itself behind me, I planted my boots in the snow and stood. I wasn't on Monte Rosa. I wasn't in the Alps. I wasn't even on a mountain at all. That's as much as I feel like transcribing tonight. My schedule's now what you would call leisurely and I need to rest up for all the hiking that I have lined up. I'll post the next section tomorrow evening, when I have some time alone with my laptop. Until then, stay safe, and well away from the cold. Hello again, I've decided to continue these logs. My team's excursion will last another 8 odd days so I'm under no obligation toward regular updates. I'll record these in what time I can get and post them once I'm back and connected to the internet. I won't drag, here's the father one from last time. Standing near the bottom of a sort of half-cone slope, the horizon wide expanse of dark water was the first hint that I was somewhere else entirely. I could tell the ocean was a ways down, but only after shuffling down to the edge did I catch a glimpse of the precipice. A rugged ice face plummeting some 400 feet. A vertigo struck instantly, knocking me onto my butt, hands splayed like a starfish. Something sticking up near the edge caught my eye. It resembled the curved rails of a pool ladder. If said ladder was poorly made and rickety, with coarse gray rope tied to each side, grain fibers sequestered by an equally ashen backdrop. A tiny ray of hope beamed somewhere deep inside of me. Maybe somebody was here. I crawled through the powder and gripped the steel bars. My gloves did nothing against the exorable chill of wind-beaten metal. Still, a desperate curiosity willed my head and shoulders to lean over the precipice. Fixed into the mottled ice, a vertical tower of crude material swayed in the ever-present winds. It reminded me of a shanty town with its hastily fastened planks and battered metal sheeting. For the life of me, I couldn't fathom what reason any sane person would have to build such a thing. But then again, I had yet to find anything in this place that I could fathom. Hello, I called out. The first words out of my mouth since waking up were hoarse and weak, tumbling pathetically down the mismatched scaffolding. There was an immediate response from somewhere below. 
I couldn't see anyone but there were multiple voices bleeding together into a garbled slur. Relief warped into regret as I remained hunched, frozen, as if I were some frost-caked gargoyle on a forgotten castle. Though my voice barely cut through the winds, I regretted opening my mouth. I didn't quite know why. The frantic shuddering of the platforms as somebody clambered up to meet me instilled a deep and imminent foreboding. I somehow hadn't realized before, but the ropes tied around the bars that I grabbed onto were actually those of a rope ladder. They whipped into the cliffside, heralding the arrival of the figure who had just pushed their way out from under a rotten blue tarp. A disheveled and wild-eyed man pulled his way up the wooden rungs, patchy bundle of matted hair swinging across his face. When he saw me, he paused, wired eyes suddenly morphing into something rabid, before continuing up the ladder with fervor. As if he had dislocated his jaw, dropped wide open and flopped around on its hinges. I didn't know what the expression meant, but suffice to say I was horrified. Those eyes, they betrayed hunger. I flopped onto my back and fumbled with the zipper on my bag, tearing out an ice pack and stealing myself. Two sets of blackening fingers curled over the rim before me, followed by this bestial vestige of a human climbing up onto the snow in all his wiry might. Hey, what are you doing there, lad? I chuckled with transparent unease. He almost looked surprised after I spoke as if language was a foreign concept to him. He sucked air in through his teeth with a hiss. Cold, cold, so hungry. You warm, fresh. He spat in a gravelly voice. I backed up, raising the ice pick clutched tight in both hands. The man went a few uncoordinated steps before lunging out of nowhere and diving on top of me. I yelped in fear of falling backwards and raising the pick in defense. A spittle sprayed from yellow teeth, gnashing inches from my face. Acting swiftly, I rammed the blunt handle of the pick into his throat, causing him to recoil. Only seconds later, he persisted with all this rage, seeming to shrug off the blow as though it were an insect bite. In the scuffle, he managed to grab my right arm, and he sunk his teeth into my wrist. I screamed and let go of the pick with my right. Instinctively, I swung it in my left, the sharp end sailing true and embedding directly into the side of his neck. Vicious blood exploded over my face as I wrenched the pick back towards me, tearing the front of his throat open in a ragged gash. The man shot up straight in response, stumbling uncontrollably back to the edge and dropping limply into the open air. And despite my close call, something else disturbed me. The blood that had poured out onto me was cold. I don't mean lukewarm, cold if not freezing. No steam rose into the air as one might expect. It just curdled and froze on my clothing. With no other choice, I crept back to the rope ladder and looked down. A ratty woman had just climbed up into view and paused after seeing the man's body supine on the platform. Oh, come on, again, Kurt. What she said took me aback, but the bubbling laugh from Kurt was the kicker. Throat practically non-existent, he was alive and laughing. Hey, I'm um, sorry about him. You can come down, it's safe. I almost joined Kurt in his hysteria. It was such an absurd proposition. Safe? You're dangling off the edge of a sheer cliff. Now let me rephrase. Safer. Trust me, you don't want to spend another minute up there. What? Nah, you're a lunatic. Do as you like, but I won't be on that platform when it collapses. I'm out of here. Are you? Are you really? Take a look around. Where in the name of God do you think you are right now? No idea, but even if my chances are one in a million at getting home, I would rather die out there than stay here. Oh, me too, traveler. Me too. With that, the conversation was over and the woman tended to Kurt. I refused to witness any more of this madness and I stormed off back up the slope that I had come down from. After a few steady paces, I stopped dead on my tracks. 
something was off. Imperceptible movement in the snowfield, distant thuds growing nearer. I squinted to make anything out but I didn't need to. There, near the buried tent that I had crawled out of, the fallen snow outlined in absence. Empty air. A strong gust flung pale dusting off the ground to form a haze, and in it the shape was clear. I couldn't tell you what it was, only what it resembled. Long, snaking, and of simply vast size. It coiled through the haze the way an air bubble darts through water. Two, maybe three, sparsely spaced legs jabbed at the ground, leaving clear imprints of whatever this thing was. Scythe-like mandibles sliced through the air towards me. It wasn't a hallucination. I could hear its sharp limbs clacking, feel its heavy steps through the ground. So I went back on my words and scampered back down to the ladder. Vertigo or not, I couldn't stand up against whatever that thing was. The girl was still tending to the man whose throat that I had torn out and shot a glance over to me. Told you, she said with a smirk. How? Oh, what was that? I couldn't see it while I could, but... Oh, it's fine, they won't come down here. I sank to the floor if it could even be called that, and a sudden wave of despair overtook me. I hadn't the first clue where I was. Something deep in the recesses of my mind doubted that I was even on Earth anymore. I'm Eleanor, by the way. Shaking, I looked over to her with a grimace, and then promptly winced from the pain of freezing wind whistling through my teeth. Mine's Tony. Why, how are you so nonchalant right now? How long have you been here in this place? How long? Oh, you poor baby, time doesn't have a say anymore. Not for me. It's not if, if clocks work here, even if I wanted to know the time. A day could be months, years, and a night could be five minutes or vice versa. There's not many things a man can do when faced with impossibility. Do you deny to enkindle self-detriment or accept and give up so easily? A question of a hopeless fight versus hopeless submission. Look, how about you come down with us, get some shelter? I know it's not optimal, but believe me when I say it's a paradise to living up here. Before, I had Rob to guide me. Whether he's still in the world that I knew or he's here somewhere, I don't know. I should hope that he made it out. But the coward in me also hopes to see him in this cursed place. To let him take the lead and the same coward in me chose to stay with Eleanor, Kurt, and the rest. The rope ladder ran down through every level. A group of us sat on a nine-foot square base of cobbled ply and sheet metal, enclosed by flapping rolls of sun-bleached canvas and tarp, a room by some sliver of a margin. At the time, there were six of us. A paler, sharp-faced man with a vaguely Slavic-tinged accent introduced himself as Alexei and spoke on behalf of Kurt. You see, friend, the hunger, it breaks down the strongest and the weakest man all the same. To eat anything substantial is rare, let alone something warm. Of the remaining two were Nia, a tan woman whose dappled skin displayed a mild vitiligo, and an older gentleman bearing several tight pink scars over his hands. The same for his face as well, uh, what could be seen of it past a graying beard. He doesn't remember his name, but everybody calls him Yago, or Santiago, something Hemingway. Never read his works myself, but as far as wind-beaten fishermen go, Yago certainly looks the part. It took a while of idle chatter for me to finally come around to the question seeping through my thoughts. So, how do you survive here? Eight words were all it took to derail the conversation and have them exchanged to pitied glances. It ain't a matter of surviving, son, Yago rasped. It's a choice between lesser evils. I was exasperated. What does that even mean, you old? Yago's sunken eyes toppled my will and I trailed off. He huffed more with fatigue than frustration, as if issuing a sentiment that he had had to repeat more times than he could remember. Try as you might, you can't die in this place. I went to bite back but swallowed my words as I remembered Kurt. He laid beside us under a dirty sheet. 
Nia must have caught on because she reached over and tugged the fabric down to reveal Kurt's injury. Now his ruined throat was filled with what looked to be ice. Only the ice looked tainted, putrid almost, with sallow mycelia exploding within. Crimson tributaries forced their way through the frost up on the left and down on the right. Tingling dread crept in a similar manner, up my spine and neck and flowing back down through my chest. If this was reality now then well, I don't know. What moral is there? What sadistic law of nature permits this? I probably should have started off with this, but there's a name written inside the front cover. Anthony Grisha means as much to me as John Doe, but the handwriting matches whoever wrote in these pages, so it's safe to assume that they're one and the same. I realize now that I'm at a crossroads. I see two choices to make here, hide my discovery or report it. Honestly, I don't feel like keeping quiet and having to live with it. Luckily, I had the foresight of donning protective gloves before taking the journal, and I've been using them since, so my fingerprints aren't smeared all over the pages. Means that I can return it and then report through my satellite radio that I found a body, all without a hitch. Don't worry, I'll take photos of the pages I'm gonna transcribe. Over half of it is illegible though, whether due to numb fingers or a broken mind, I can't tell. I rang the project manager this morning, told her about the body and she said to just hang in there. They won't be making any unnecessary trips apparently and she knows as well as I do that the cold will prevent any losses in the realm of identification. Forensics will be along in the heli, which is due in one week. The first thing that I'm doing when I get home is having a hot shower for longer than it's probably healthy, and posting these logs. Returning the journal went smoothly, relatively speaking. Bending stiff fingers into place isn't the most pleasant of tasks, but I think that I'm in the all clear. And back to the matter at hand. Having a bit of a hard time writing all this from photos on my phone, but it'll do. I've cut a few parts which seem like pointless rambling, as well as pages marked by water damage in some disconcerting brown and red splotches. Here it is. I'm not sure why I keep on with this journaling. In no world do I imagine its pages will see the light of any day except the wildly inconsistent sun of this place. Though calling that thing a sun would be like calling a faulty light bulb a fireplace. There's no warmth or constancy to it, rather befitting for wherever we are. I also quite literally have all the time in the world. I guess I'm not in the world though, not anymore, not really. So I would like to describe my memories, my experiences, this godforsaken place in as vivid detail as possible, because that's how this place is. There's no hyperbole to be had. Its aspects, its nuances, all grim, lurid sores competing for my attention. Perhaps it's a comfort and nothing more. Reiteration for the sake of it. Well, I would rather think of anything else, any place else, but here is all there is. Maintenance. With no other choice, I have learned quickly what to do and what to avoid either empirically alongside my fellow captives or from their lessons. Every few actually, just whenever we need to, we set out in the snowfield above and alternating groups of two or three. Oftentimes the invisible creatures move to someplace else, leaving the path clear for us. I would let them use my ice picks, though I made it clear that if it was my turn, I would always have one in hand. The third member used some kind of socket wrench with a sharp stone driven into the end. The iceberg is possibly the most treacherous ground that I've ever had to traverse. Fishers hide under deceptive snow overhangs. One misstep on such unstable ground means a falling a hundred feet into an icy casket. That wouldn't be so bad since you could eventually climb your way out. Only the boar worms that tunnel deep inside the ice are quick to snatch up anything coming their way. And worse still, those see-through monsters come and go as they please. I myself have been caught, what, eight odd times. 
the way their mandibles carve and cleave. They must be serrated because it hurts. It hurts so much that there's no real word for it. I would much rather not experience the sensation again, but we have to go searching. We have to. Most of the time we find little, usually nothing. A beaten metal sheet or frost-blackened planks are cause for celebration. You see, our cliff dwelling doesn't stay by itself. If only it were that easy. No, the iceberg is sinking constantly at a glacial rate into the abyssal brine below. Perpetual snowfall packs itself down into ice over time and roughly maintains the iceberg's elevation. So we have to deconstruct, dismember the lower levels and lug them back to the top. Drive old rebar into the cliff with blunt objects and fastened everything back together. If that's not work enough, the whole iceberg sways imperceptibly over time. It tilts forwards to precarious angles, resting for a drawn out solstice before tipping backwards again. Lose your presence of mind and there's no second chance. Down into the freezing waters you go, torn apart by scaled monsters with their jagged spines and shark's teeth. Never blessed with the mercy of death until every cell in your violated body is torn and strewn asunder. Of course, there's a respite when the iceberg leans backwards. It's not something to get complacent with. Listen to that nagging reminder telling you that at some point, you'll be back in the same spot. That's your survival instinct talking, obsolete as it is. And even then, when you feel prepared for anything, this place always has an ace up its sleeve. Blubbers. My first introduction to this concept was, well, it was a while after my arrival. I would like to embellish the memory to say that we were sitting around a fire as something to that effect, but there was no chance of that. Even behind cover from the wind, it's like the warped physical laws here outright forbid as sparks and flames. And now I sat beside Alexi and Nia on a pile of salt-crusted cloth. Without much else to pass the time, we had engaged in half-hearted games and hobbies. And contrary to his appearance, Iago had a strong singing voice. I'm kind of amazed that he can remember any songs. The man can't recall his own name for Pete's sake. I guess it's like Alzheimer's. Music's the last to flee memory. Or so I've heard. At the time he stood out on the platform before us, he was singing, I think it was, the green, green grass of home. In spite of the choppy gale his voice carried, it was pleasant, and this song in particular rang with a nostalgia. Once Diego had finished, he stood with his hands held together. A pretty good old man, Alexi cheered. I bobbed my head in agreement. Yeah, that's really something. God knows I wouldn't opinion you as a singer, said Nia. Iago chuckled and for a fleeting moment, our troubles were lost. I guess we were too distracted to hear the heavy shuffling from below because we fell back to silence when an enormous hand wrapped around the edge of the platform. Whatever pulled itself over that edge, it was no creation of any sane god. A gray blubbery flash rippled in the wind. A disgusting, bloated thing the size of a tractor tire peered over at us. A head. Scattered perforations in these sides must have been ears, but it had no facial features other than a burbling, X-shaped hole right in the middle. Two or three more sets of hands clambered their way up to us, somehow crawling up the ice as if they were geckos. None of these details held a candle to what their overall features resembled. Infants. Elephant-sized, hell-spawn toddlers crawling on all fours. Laggardly with age, Iago had no chance. Swollen, sticky fingers curled around his body, squeezing him in a grasp that even world-record strongmen could not escape. The awful harmony they made upon claiming their new plaything is etched into my soul. Gargling coos of childlike elation, deep in pitch and easily drowning out his hysterics. In the brief period before they left, I watched oblivious to these screams of Nia and Alexi as the creatures shook him around and pulled at his limbs. All I could hear were joints and bones snapping and cracking. 
The creature holding Yago brought him up to the dribbling hole of its face. The hole dilated, revealing a cavernous passage of dripping flesh, and with slowness I'm sure was intentional. Pushed him inside, feet first up to his neck. It closed around him with such pressure that I could hear his body breaking, and with crushed lungs he couldn't even scream. And just like that they descended, leaving us with a cold empty space shaped like an old man. That's how it goes here, no mercy, just suffering. Endless, indiscriminate suffering. Still, there are a handful of things that we can predict, or at the very least, expect. The ice. Now it may be logical to melt the ice and drink it. We are, after all, still subject to thirst and hunger despite needing no food or water to live. Fresh snow from up above is okay, but the ice is bad water. It's rotten. It putrefies and becomes teeming with disease. In particular, it hosts some kind of parasite. Drink it and they'll start breeding inside you until your organs are rife with them. They sap any moisture they can from your body, drying you into a shriveled husk. Oh, and they're permanent too. There's literally no way to get them out. Now I mentioned boar worms before. They're not an issue most of the time. Sometimes if you look deep into the ice cliff, you can see them burrowing within. They are lightning fast though, so I can never get a clear picture of them. From what I can gather, they're long, thick, and leech-like. Their heads open up to reveal strangely mechanical sets of spike balls which spin against each other to grind through the ice. I don't know if they're immune to the parasites. Maybe they're symbiotic. Worm eat ice, parasite take water, who knows. This nameless place has fates aplenty except for one, death. I didn't know how it worked at first, but it later on became clear. Months, perhaps even years after Yago's abduction, something happened that was gut-wrenching and incredible in equal measure. About 25 feet off from us, the ice began growing outwards. Small mounds at first, swelling like rotten pustules. It was when a familiar visage began forming that it clicked, and we built a walkway across. Through some uncouth law of nature, Iago grew in the form of an ice sculpture, and then color flushed his skin, staring at his fingertips and slowly spreading. He eventually broke free with a crack and a pop and fell down into our arms, vacant-eyed and nude, a grotesque and wholly unnatural birth. Miyago was never the same after that. Deference held our tongues from prying until the curiosity got too much to bear. Even when we prodded him and asked him about what had happened, not one word has spilled from his lips. I shudder to think about what might have happened during his absence at the hands of those abominations, things that considered him nothing more than a toy to wear out. We've taken to calling them blubbers, I would say it describes them to a T. With a honed skillet hiding, they're not too hard to avoid. The problem is hearing them approach before they arrive because if you don't, well, no need to repeat what's already written. Past that, a worse revelation came to light. No matter what we do or what happens to us, no matter how violent or peaceful the death, we'll return spat right back out into the fray every time, no matter what. From this point, the frequency of errors in scribbling rises drastically. I find it strange the near instant transition from madman scrawl to legible comprehensive records just a page over. As such, there's a few things left for me to post here. This reads as a fantasy as most would have realized. In any other scenario, I would settle on that and leave it in the past. The reality is, however, there's a naked dead body hundreds of miles out in the tundra. Forensics will look for any signs of foul play, of course, but why come out this far to dispose of a body? How? And besides, there's no major trauma to the body. Unless he was posed like some grim marionette, the likely conclusion is he died from the cold. Emil, our geologist, wants the first half of tomorrow to confer and discuss our findings, 
so I'm gonna go and get some shut eye. It's hard, admittedly, knowing there's a frozen cadaver in walking distance from me, but at least I don't have to bear that burden alone anymore. And good night for now. So, it's been a few days since I last wrote about this, and been crunching pretty hard. Hopefully the quote is met before pickup arrives tomorrow. Though I think we'll have some spare time with the forensics team on site. Sorry, I'm stalling. Here's the next section. The Uncoupled The brutality displayed in this realm is nothing to be scoffed at, but at the very least you grow accustomed to it. Meat and bone lose their sting. And yet, there are some things the scars can't toughen you against. One in particular stands out to me. Kurt and I were on a scouting trip. We had long since made amends by this time and agreed to let bygones be just that. Plodding along the ridge of a snow dune, Kurt cocked his head to look at something, and then grabbed my shoulder with a wary firmness. Get down, now. We both dropped down below cover. I hadn't seen anything, but by now I trusted Kurt's judgment. What? What did you see? I caught it in the corner of my eye. Thank God I ain't look at it. Without thinking, I went to peek over into the open snowfield, and Kurt tore me back down by the scruff of my jacket, bringing me to eye level. What are you doing, you oaf? Don't look at it. I stared confused. At what? The uncoupled. I should really get Ellie to go over. Well, slow down, uncoupled. Yeah, don't look too deep into the name. I only seen it in the corner of my vision before. Just a dark shape. Nothing more than that, a stain. A stain on the world. Carefully, I turned my head in the direction that he had seen it. As if I'd be able to see right through the snow. Okay, and if you can't look at it, how do you know? I've been plenty here before you, mate. Knew one or two of them, this kid called a uh, Kent, yup. He looked, said it was hollow and sort of an empty imprint that might have once been a person. I think he said something along the lines of, It's like if you took somebody and stripped everything away except their being. Still not sure what he really meant, but it's enough to know I ain't never gonna look at it. Well, that and the fact that a moment later he's already 30 feet ahead and stumbling towards it. I'm pausing to let Kurt's words sink in, I muttered. Oh, well, where is he now? I mean, Miago got taken and he came back. He shook his head, eyes focused on nothing. I couldn't tell ya. The only way I even remember him is because of his voice. The screams, the god-awful wailing surfing across the dunes and through the air. In those short times when the wind stumbles and you just listen. Following his lead, I cocked an ear upwards, a frostbitten air slicing past my skin. There was nothing other than the howling gale and the hammering of my heart. However, the longer that I listened, I picked up on something distinct from the wind whistling. It did sound like screaming. For all I know, Kurt could have just been pulling a sick prank. It's easy to hear things that aren't out there, to see what you want to see. Only as I focused, it began to morph into the tone and timbre of a voice that I still remembered, one that I remembered well. It was the last voice that I had heard before this all happened. I tried not to think about it. Help me. The words were hissed straight into my ear. It startled me so bad that my legs straightened and I hopped off the ground. No question that time, it was his voice. After that, it wasn't a matter of not thinking about it, but of trying to forget. I must have been in a trance when Kurt spoke up again, snapping his fingers. Hey, you alright? Come on, we should get back. I ain't seen nothing out there worth the risk today. Just, uh, if you ever see something in the corner of your eyes, something darker than dark, leave. I nodded, grimacing, and we made our way back down to our home. Weather. If constant freezing snowfall wasn't enough, the weather knows worst cruelty. For the most part, we have shelter if it starts raining anything untoward. If you're caught out on the snowfield, though, well, let's say you'll be back in a few weeks at the best. Months or years at worst. 
That happened one time while Eleanor and Alexia went out scavenging. They must have been on their way back when it started raining these razor sharp ice shards. Finger sized blades that sliced straight through canvas and embedded deep into wooden platforms. Pain snarls from above heralded Alexi's arrival, the rope ladder quivering under his descent. The best way that I can describe how he looked was as if a shrapnel grenade had detonated three feet in front of him. Well, all around him, really. Deep, weeping gashes littered his body and strands of flayed skin danced in the wind. It was like looking at a mangled human-shaped version of those cheese strings. You know, the ones that you peel strips off of. I wish I could taste one of those again. Anyway, there wasn't much that we could do except bandage him up, and even then, it was more so we didn't have to see his injuries. I realized in my stupidity that something we had overlooked. He was alone. Wait, Alexi, where's Ellie? Neo whimpered. Did she fall behind? He sat there lifeless. It could have been the bandages wrapped around his head. I think he was just too broken to register the question. Alexi, where is she? With his throat and chest a pulpy mess, Alexi's voice was a little more than a grating rattle. Didn't make it. Ankles, Achilles sliced to pieces. She fell down a crack. Nia just stood there, letting her head low back and let out a forlorn wail into the sky. One of transparent despair and indignance at this world. One that I felt all too closely. I remember looking into the eyes and seeing torn flesh dangling from a boarworm's mouth. Dull pink smudges carried through the ice as they tunneled. A while later, two or three weeks to the guess, her rebirth began. It seems that whenever this happens, they aren't too far away. 30 feet tops, but I don't want to jinx it. Maybe it's luck, more likely it's just how this place works. I dream sometimes of being reborn from the ice, only to fall out rigid and lifeless. But all we get are failed attempts. Uh, very, very dark. I almost sympathize with the author, I just don't want to believe it. I would like to just pass it off as a testament to human creativity. Yet at the same time, is it better to be sure of true horror or to leave questions unanswered, left to echo around in the edifice of unknowing? I'll be thinking about that for sure, though something in me leans toward the latter. By tomorrow, I'll have the answers, or so I hope. Until then, my modus operandi will be hammering out research and then sitting tight under a blanket. Stay safe out there. Early finish on the road of today, which leaves me with two or three hours before our escort arrives. This is the final just about legible segment of the journal and I can't help but have a strange feeling after reading it. There's a handful of disquieting notions in my head, but I'll save them for after. It's best to read this first, what is in effect a surrogate denouement. That said, there's no resolution to be had, no convergent threads. There's no satisfying conclusion for this dismal tome of events. Whatever the case, it's up to the reader to draw their own meanings, whatever you see fit. The storm. And there's one more thing I find worthy of putting on paper, and that is the storm. It happens at random, according to Kurt. There's no pattern to its visits. I've only witnessed it twice in my time here. The first time, it swirled on the distant skyline. I found myself totally wrapped in its magnificence. A terrifying sight to behold. We've been imprisoned in a night that must have lasted at least two or three years, relatively speaking, and in accordance with the darkness, the only light being the bruised, moonless firmament. It took a while for the black clouds to register, congealing across the waters. While it wasn't hard to notice after deep crimson flashes lit up in its bowels, pulsing vermilion glimmers so full of energy that I could feel heat wash over my face from across the waters. That heat grew into a roiling whirlwind as the storm neared. The others were quick to stir from their meager shut-eye when they too felt it. What the heck's that? Nia stammered evidently as clueless as I was. Oh no, no please god no not again, Kurt croaked. 
Guys, what's happening? What is that out there? I asked. Storms are coming. We all turned to Diego and sank. Those were the only words that he had spoken since he had returned from the blubbers, and the mere sound of his voice came as a shock. We pressed for details, but he had already sunken back to his dead-tongued dejection. Kurt was no help either. He just shivered and stared paralytic into the churning depths of the storm head. I'll be honest, after the storm drew nearer and pattering rain replaced the snow, a certain excitement overtook me. Inky blots darted across the flashing lights deep in the storm clouds, captivating me in awe. I threw my head back and opened my mouth, allowing the rain to spread its warmth across my tongue. It felt heavenly, the sensation of warmth after so long deprived was like nothing that I had felt before. The euphoria was short-lasting and concern replaced it as the raindrops turned scalding. When they started to burn and sizzle off my face, I flinched and dove back under cover. Before long, the air was an all-enveloping haze of steam. It was like we had just entered some malfunctioning steam room. Each breath brought with it a flaring heat that spread from my lungs to the rest of my organs. Funny, isn't it? In winter, it's cold and dreary and you wish it was summer instead and then when summer rolls around, the beating sun and stifling nights make you yearn for the cooler seasons. In that boiling cloud, I begged for the cold to come back. At least we could layer up in coats and pants. There's nothing to be done about the heat. You can't exactly take your skin off when it's too hot. Momentary relief came as cool trickling streams from above, but my relief was sorely misguided when I understood what it was. Meltwater. Minor runnels quickly inflated to a formidable downpour, and then into a violent rapid. Nothing could be heard over the roar of rushing water. Blind, breathless, and panicking, I reached out for a hold, my fingers wrapped around metal, a pole driven into the ice. I held on with everything that I had. There was a thump beside me, a gurgled shriek. Eleanor. Despite my total exertion to keep from being swept away, I outstretched a hand. Ellie, here, grab it. I screamed, a candle in the wind to the rapids. Without delay, I felt her slippery fingers intertwine with my own. I heaved. I felt as if my spine would snap right there and then. I just didn't have the strength. The cold torrent stabbed all the excess energy from my muscles. Help me! Following the cry, I barely made out the figure of Kurt clinging helplessly to a torn canvas. The steam swallowed him up again and my stomach nodded when a harsh tearing noise scraped my eardrums. In total uncut despair, I watched as Kurt plummeted past the platform and out of sight. And as if on cue, Ellie's fingers slipped away. My heart felt as empty as my palm. Her screams faded from my ears, replaced by the incessant torrent. I don't remember the weight following, only the waterfall suddenly abating, giving way to familiar gray murk hanging in the sky. Kurt and Eleanor were gone. In any other situation, I might have found solace knowing that they had drowned, or perhaps even died on impact with the ocean. Of course, that was out of the question. We were left knowing with absolute certainty that they were going through unimaginable suffering, and far more to come. Whether at the hands of unseen leviathans, blubbers, or any other nameless things lurking in the depths, it didn't matter. I just hoped whatever found them was vicious enough to tear them apart, digest their bodies into nothing, and allow them to return. A week passed and Eleanor began to regrow. Another two weeks later and Kurt appeared. After their rebirth, we all knew better than to prod. Just leave them be, let them process it, and let them decompress. Loss may seem a trivial affliction without death, but it would be naive to think of loss as a purely physical separation. Yes, you may be taken away, put through unspeakable suffering, and then be reborn. For lack of a better term, those victims lose some integral part of their being slowly chipped and whittled away. Something so abstract is so important, yet it cannot be grasped by the hand. Once it's gone, there's no reeling it back. And still we went on. 
we had no choice and fell back on mindless habits for comfort. In a way, we found a paltry success in learning what makes this place tick. Trial and error, however awful those trials have been. My thoughts lingered on the storm after it happened a second time. We were seasoned, prepared for what was to come, making sure that our cover was uninfiltrated by the elements. We pulled together ropes and twine and tied them around ourselves and fastened the ends to various driven poles and stakes. Maybe I had been too focused on the storm and its sizzling droplets to catch Iago unfastening himself and standing up. A yell from Alexi brought me to attention, but it was too late. Iago, already several paces away, lumbered toward the edge of the platform. We all thought that he would jump, futile as it'd be, but he didn't. Instead, he threw off his shoes, socks, jacket, and pants, everything, until he stood as stark naked exposed to the elements. At this point, we knew better than jumping up to help. We had no fault in this, he would come back eventually after all. Yet I could sense something changing. I don't know what or when it started, but it was there. A shift, a redirection of energy. He howled as his skin bubbled and blistered under the storm's ferocity. I think it was when his skin began sloughing off in great swaths that it happened. Without warning, Iago's entire being burst into a furious red flame. The sparkling vermilion plasma crackling with the intensity of lightning. Eyes watering from the heat, I watched transfixed as his silhouette, shrouded in fire, seemed to be eaten away into nothing. Not a puff of smoke or steam billowed from him. His backlit shadow disintegrated inch by inch, until the last smattering of fragments were burned away entirely. Absolutely nothing remained of him once the storm passed. Not one stray hair or nail fragment. Of course, we expected him to grow out from the ice face, right away in fact, but nothing happened. We scanned every last inch of the cliff. Nothing. It's been hell, I can't even guess how long it's been since then. It's all just so arbitrary, meaningless. Could be decades, centuries, millennia. My family might be long dead by now. Even humanity could already have gone extinct. And in all that time, I've yet to see even a hint of Yago's return. Maybe he's in another, worse place. Maybe he's dead. Or maybe he made it back home. Those are the only possibilities that I can imagine, and, and as far as I can see, that's a two-third chance of escaping this place. Escaping eternity. Next time the storm comes around, I think that I'll follow that old man's example. Stripped down to my most human form, raw for the whole world to see. Well, not completely. I'll be bringing this notebook with me. I'll clutch it tight to my heart as the tempest roars around us. And maybe, just maybe, the rain will set me free. So here we are. I'm not really sure what to make of this. It's almost like two situations bound as one. An unexplainable body and an unbelievable journal. Together, it's like the opposite poles of two magnets pulling together into some cohesive whole. But as I said in the prologue to this entry, there are still a few things that I keep thinking over, over and over to no avail. According to the journal, the last location that I can identify would be Monte Rosa. That's between Italy and Switzerland, over 3,000 miles away from here. Even if somebody wanted to dump a body, they would need air transport. There are no roads not this far out. There are plenty of remote places to bury a body and here is not one of them. Permafrost starts less than two feet down, so you're more likely to break your shovel before digging out a grave. But if there is a third party involved, why would they pose the body? Unless they simply left him here to die, but why? I hear something, I think that the chopper's here. I'll see what I can gather from the forensics guys and to finish this afterwards. Wow, I didn't expect them to be so forthcoming. They flicked through the journal and ran a missing persons check for one Anthony Grisha, and it's true. British, last known location 11 days ago climbing Monte Rosa with a friend, a friend who's also missing. We've been here two weeks though, and I only found the body five days in. 
which means the longest period between disappearance and discovery would be two days. I'm starting to get a headache trying to rationalize all this, and there's something else bothering me too. Is there an old man missing from somewhere in the world? Somebody who could be compared to a certain Hemingway character? If so, will he be found somewhere cold and isolated or perhaps somewhere more populated? And if he's found alive, what would he say? What would he recount? In all honesty, I hope these questions stay unanswered. I don't want to know. Whatever he'd reveal to the world does not belong here. It might prove something that should remain in the dark, a quiet unknown. A place that I've already stepped one misguided foot into. If you've got family and friends coming for dinner this holiday season, then you're already anticipating that. Oh my gosh, do I have enough food type of feeling. It's not fun, but there's no need for it. And get wild grain and you always have crowd-pleasing bread, rolls, pastries, pastas, and more in your freezer. Wild grain is the first ever bake from frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. Unlike typical supermarket bread, wild grain uses a slow fermentation process that's easier on your belly, lower in sugar, and rich in nutrients and antioxidants. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. You'll never run the risk of getting bored with wild grain. They're constantly adding new seasonal and limited time special items to try. And plus for every new member, wild grain donates 6 meals to the Greater Boston Food Bank so you can eat good and do good all at the same time. All you have to do is sign up at wildgrain.com slash creep and choose which type of box you want to receive and how often. It's easy to reschedule, skip, or cancel. And plus, for a limited time, you can get $30 off your first box, plus free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash creep to start your subscription. Yeah, you heard me, free croissants in every box and $30 off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash creep. That's wildgrain.com slash creep, or you can use promo code creep at checkout. If you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. There's still time to find incredible original gifts with the help of Uncommon Goods. Uncommongoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. We're talking moms, dads, teens, in-laws, besties, your one and only. And it's not stuff that you can find just anywhere. Uncommon Goods has unique and creative gifts, often handmade by independent artists and makers. So skip the gifts that scream last minute and find something truly original at Uncommon Goods. A few of my favorite things that I found from their site, one being the birthstone ornament. A Christmas ornament themed to your birthstone, pretty cool. And a grilled a personal pizza maker. This compact little baker makes a brick oven style pizza right in your grill. It's simple, easy, delicious. Throw your pizza inside and put it on the grill and you're good to go. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the US. They have the most meaningful, out of the ordinary gifts anywhere. And to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash mrcreeps. That's uncommongoods.com slash mrcreeps for 15% off. And don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. <laughs> 